In part one, we considered arguments in favor of the theory of functionalism, the idea that the mind is a collection of functional states in a physical medium. Here we'll look at some criticisms of that view. Now, as we look at problems with functionalism, it will also present some arguments that will apply generally to physicalism of any type, including the identity theory. So these arguments might even push us back toward substance dualism or a kind of dualism, of some sort of dualism. And the first concern with functionalism has to do with intentionality. Intentionality is the meaning of words that we use. And there's a famous argument by John Searle, and we'll call this the Chinese room argument. And in order to set it up, consider a room where you are placed and there is a language that you don't understand for Searle that was Chinese. And there are a lot of cards with Chinese symbols on them. And there is a book that tells you what to do in certain situations. Now there's a slot in one of the doors of the room that you're in and they put cards into the slot. You collect them, you look at your rule book and you find other cards that have other Chinese symbols on them. And then you put them out in a certain order. You have no idea what the symbols mean. The guidebook might call them squiggle squaggle or something like that. And you just pick up the, the symbol that you can recognize by sight, but have no idea what it means in order to do this. And so he imagines that the people on the outside are Chinese speakers and you get very efficient at doing this. Maybe you even rule, memorize the rule book, you get very fast at it. And uh, from the perspective of the Chinese person on the outside, they are interacting with a human who understands Chinese. They're interacting with a mind at least that understands Chinese. But Searle says, look, if the mind is merely a matter of functionality, then there must be a mind present in the Chinese room. We imagine this is a program that could pass the Turing test. And all along, of course, Searle never learns Chinese. He has no idea what any of the symbols mean, even if he becomes extremely proficient at doing what we've described. And if it's a matter of functionality, then you've got a mind in the Chinese room. But the problem is, of course, there is no mind in the Chinese room. Yes, there's Searle with a mind, but there's no mind that understands Chinese. There's not the kind of mind that the people on the outside think there is. And so that's the important mind that we're looking for. And that means that the mind is not merely a matter of functionality, which means that functionalism is false. It lacks intentionality, understanding. And so Searle says, even if we could develop an AI pro program that passed the Turing test proficiently, and everyone seems to believe that it's a person, Searle says, well, there's probably this problem of the program still not actually understanding what's going on when it's talking or writing or whatever it's doing. Now, a second problem has to do with qualia. And we'll look at a couple concerns related to qualia, two or three arguments, in fact. And qualia are the sensations, the qualitative aspect of what it feels to experience certain things. So to experience a tickle or pain or seeing the color orange. There's a certain qualitative experience in doing that. And we'll look at Jackson's argument. Frank Jackson has a famous argument that has to do with Mary, a color scientist. And Mary is a very proficient color scientist. Mary knows 
every physical fact concerning color vision. So she knows all the physiology, the biology of the brain. She knows all about light, the physics, the refraction, what makes light wavelengths of one color different from another, and how it affects when we see color on objects. All those things Mary knows about. But the problem is, the, the catch is here, there's something about Mary. Mary does not know what it's like to see red. Mary has been fitted with these glasses, or maybe we could say contacts even, that have been permanently attached to her eyes that makes her see everything in black and white. And so she has never experienced the various colors that she has studied her entire life. So she knows all the physical facts about color vision, but she still doesn't know what it's like to see red. And what it's like to see red then couldn't possibly be a physical event. Mary knows all the physical facts, but she doesn't know what it's like to see red. So that's not a physical event. So that means there's some information about the mind, in this case, what it's like to see red, that is not about the physical world. And because of that, then we can conclude that physicalism broadly is incorrect. So functionalism that requires a physical medium is going to be incorrect and the identity theory is going to be incorrect. All physicalist theories are incorrect according to the conclusion of Jackson's argument. A second argument having to do with qualia is related to an inverted spectrum. And so in order to understand this argument, we need to uh, set ourselves up a little bit, gain some understanding, have a little background about what an inverted spectrum is. First of all, let's think about this in terms of black and white vision. So these are some photos that I took at a balloon rally and being clever and artistic, I took them in black and white, which yes, is not the thing you want to do at a balloon rally, but in any case, Here's a black and white photo that I took at a balloon rally. Now, you can invert this, and so it would look like this, right? The places that are the darkest when we initially saw the balloon here are now going to be the lightest when we go to this picture here that's inverted. So that's what we mean by inverting the spectrum. What is dark becomes very light. What is very light becomes very dark. So in the bottom corner here, you see that it's very dark. That meant the initial uh, photo, it was very light. Okay, well, we can do the same thing with color. Yes, I did, in fact, take color photos at the balloon rally. So here are, are balloons with some great color, and we can invert the colors here. So the, the balloon in the foreground with the large yellow section in, in the middle uh, upper right portion becomes blue or kind of purplish. Now, if you go back to that yellow, see, look at the yellow stars on the balloon in the middle. Well, they look like that when you invert the color. Of course, the background there, which is very yellow, was inversion of a blue sky. And if you point, look to any given red square or a red stripe on any of the balloons, pick one out now, and you see that it's kind of a turquoise color. And so we, that's what color inversion is like. Now, imagine there in the foreground is a a little girl, and that's my daughter. Imagine that she was just learning her colors, and I was talking to her, and I pointed to that large section of the balloon in the foreground that's yellow, and imagine she has something going on in her mind that she perceives it like this. And so I ask her what color that is, and she says that's yellow. She has learned that that color there is yellow. Now look 
at the stars on the balloon, it's the same color to her, so she calls that color yellow. And I look at the balloon with the stars and I say, that's very good, you've identified yellow. And now I say, can you point to something that is green? And the balloon with the two stars on it, one of those stars is in a green background there, as you can see. And now if we move to the way she sees it, it's kind of a pink color. And so what now she knows what is she perceives as that color, what we would call pink, she calls green. She has learned that that is green. So now on this photo, identify another section of green in a different balloon, which would be, you know, the pink, that pinkish color, identify it, find a portion of a balloon with that pinkish color. And if you do, when we go back, you can see that that's green. And we can continue to do this likewise. And if my daughter points to the same colors all the time, says, yes, that's green. So when I see green, she sees green. She sees what she calls green. Of course, it's looking more pinkish to her, but she calls it green. All right, what does all this mean? This is entirely possible. For all I know, this is true of my daughter. She is like that, for all I know that she has learned her colors in that way. She would function perfectly fine if she goes to kindergarten she, and she's asked to pick out a green color, she will do so successfully. For her, it will look pinkish, what we would call pinkish, but it will be the green crayon that she pulls out. So she's going to function just as anyone else in the world in terms of colors. She has the wide full spectrum of colors that she sees. She can identify them all correctly. Okay, what's the purpose of all of this? Here's the argument with the inverted spectrum. If an inverted spectrum, the way we just described it, is possible at all, it doesn't have to be the case, it just has to be possible, then someone who perceived an inverted spectrum would function exactly the same as someone who does not. Now, here's what I think, you know, something for you to contemplate. It could be you that's experiencing the inverted function. That is, it's possible that the rest of the world sees everything like this, and you're the odd one who sees it like this. All right, but in any case, this kind of inverted perspective perception of the spectrum of colors is possible. And if it is, then the person would function exactly the same as anyone else. And so that means that the function of the mind is the same, but the qualitative experience of the mind is not. And we can conclude, therefore, that there's more to the mind than how it functions in a physical medium, which means physicalism is false and functionalism in particular here is false and we'll have uh, ted the technician correct that when i said physicalism i'm sure he'll take care of it okay a uh, third argument about qualia and physicalism comes from thomas nagel and he has an argument related to a bat and he raises this question, what is it like to be a bat, right? There's, there must be something that it's like to be a bat, to be able to fly around and navigate by echolocation. There's something it's like, but it's not something that we know by an objective experience, right? So he imagines an omniscient chiroptologist. And a chiroptologist is someone who, specializes in studying bats, right? A zoologist who studies bats is a chiroptologist. Okay, you never know what you might learn with a philosophy video. All right, so we imagine an omniscient one who knows absolutely everything there is to know about the physical attributes of bats. But that omniscient chiroptologist still wouldn't know what it's like to be a bat. So the mind has this subjective aspect, the subjective aspect 
that experiences the qualia of our experiences, right? That part of our experiences. And that's not captured by functionalism. So let's, let's put this in an argument form, right? If the physicalism is correct, if, the, if that theory is correct and functionalism is one version of physicalism, then that would mean that all the information about the mind is about the physical world. It has to be. If that's all there is, are physical things, then everything we know about the mind is about the physical world. However, there is some information about the mind of a bat, for example, that's not about the physical world, right? This omniscient chiroptologist doesn't know what it's like to be a bat, doesn't know what it's like to get around by echolocation, to be able to track a mosquito that's flying and, and eat it out of midair, right? Something a bat can do that humans just can't grasp what it's like to do that. So there, there is that information. And so that means that physicalism in general is incorrect. Now, in, let's take a little more time to make sure that we're really clear on the second premise. Why does he think the second premise is true, right? This is this is where the work is being done. So here is support for the second premise. Suppose that a chiroptologist knew all the physical information about bats. The chiroptologist does not know what it's like to be a bat, but there is something it's like to be a bat. And therefore we know that there's some information about the mind of a bat that's not about the physical world. So that's why we have that second premise in our argument that some information about the mind of a bat that's not about the physical world, we put it with our first premise, we draw the conclusion. And this one, notice, is not specifically directed at functionalism, it's directed at physicalism as a whole. So it's a criticism of the identity theory as much as it is of functionalism. And again, this would push us back towards some kind of dualism. Now, there are other kinds of dualism besides substance dualism that we haven't gone into. Property dualism is a major kind of dualism, uh, but we're not going to cover that in our Introduction to Philosophy course. If you want to know about property dualism, you can go on and read any Introduction to Philosophy of Mind and find that view. But those are the criticisms of functionalism and of physicalism in general.